guten Abend, vielen Dank für Ihre Geduld. Wir sind heute recht zahlreich. Mein Name ist Franziska Nori, ich bin Leiterin des Frankfurter Kunstvereins und Curatorial Host dieser Ausstellung Three Doors, Drei Türen, Forensic Architecture, Initiative 19. Februar Hanau und Initiative in Gedenken an Uri Giallo. Heute ist der erste Ausstellungstag und insofern haben wir auch diese Gelegenheit gleich genutzt. Erl Weizmann, Robert Trufford und Dimitra Andrizu hier einzuladen, Ihnen die neuen Fälle, die jetzt in dieser Ausstellung zum ersten Mal der Öffentlichkeit präsentiert wurden, genauer gestern in der Pressekonferenz und heute durch Ihren Besuch, noch mal uns genau zu, zu zeigen, mit welchen Methodiken, mit welchen Praktiken und auch mit welchen inhaltlichen Plausibilitäten diese neuen Recherchen belegt wurden. Forensic Architecture ist eine Rechercheagentur, die 2011 an der Goldsmith Academy in London gegründet wurde und im letzten Jahr 2021 eine Schwesteragentur in Deutschland gegründet hat, in Berlin. Und gemeinsam haben wir vor gar nicht allzu langer Zeit, das sind knapp zehn Monate, dieses ähm, für uns recht ja, auch komplexe Projekt entwickelt, was hier in Frankfurt stattfindet, weil die Bedeutung Frankfurts gerade in dieser Nähe, die wir ja hier alle erleben täglich, zu Offenbach, zu Dietzenbach, zu Hanau eine besondere Bedeutung erhält. Ich würde gar nicht lange Vorrede halten. Ich glaube, wir sind alle sehr gespannt, was ihr uns heute erzählt. Es wird circa eine Stunde einen Vortrag geben und danach ähm, würden wir Sie einladen, Ihre Fragen an Forensic Architecture zu stellen. Wir zeichnen heute auf, auch Ihre Fragen. Sie sind nicht im Bild, sodass Sie wissen, dass Ihre Stimme zu hören sein wird, aber Ihre Gesichter, Ihre Privatsphäre behalten werden. So, vielen Dank. Hier ist noch ein Platz. Diana, möchtest du vorkommen? Good. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Is this, is this working? You hear it? Um, Francisca, thank you so much for hosting this exhibition, for inviting us to present here, for working with us so closely. Um, as we understood together how an exhibition like that can function both in an art space uh, and in a greater sort of public debate, public space that is amplified by an exhibition. I think for us, we would speak about the Hanau uh, attack, but we thought that um, it's because for many reasons, partly because the exhibition is here, the videos should be seen. This is not going to be a kind of uh, a shortcut into the exhibition that is there. I mean, I think all of you would know that you would need, when you come here, you would need to give this exhibition several good hours uh, of your attention. And um, so, in a sense, I think Part of what we want to do today is tell you why that project is so important for us, why it's so emotional for us, uh, why it's been such an important process for forensic architecture uh, to come to Germany, open a new agency, and to open that new agency to launch that agency of collaborative practitioners through this particular project. And I think each one of us coming into it and forensic architecture, forensic, forensis sort of as an organization includes I guess about 30 people, almost 30 people. Each one of us come from a different place. Most of us come from um, a life history of struggle most of us bring into our work, our life experience, uh, our politics, and that's besides the sort of uh, our you know, intellectual ability and technical studiousness, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but that amazing moment for us and seeing you here 
and seeing here in the audience also some of the people that lost the most precious thing of all, their children. Being here with you as, as the opening of Forensis has been an incredibly important project and I cannot think of a better way uh, to start or to restart rather our kind of uh, work in Germany. I think that you know it's not our first time in Germany. I think that maybe some of you have seen work that we've done here, um, definitely in Germany, in Hessen in particular. Here we are again. It's not that we have a Hessen obsession. <laughs> uh, it's not that we think this is need to be, you know, within a sort of worldwide uh, landscape of human rights violation, a sort of the uh, a focal point. It's just that Hessen calls us again and again and again. Uh, it's on, our f in, on the phone to us. There are many reasons. Partly is the continuity of violence and the continuity of negation that is part of violence. And we'll speak today about how negation is actually part of violence. How racist violence cannot actually exist within, without the covering of its own traces. And that's what's particular about racist crimes. Racist crimes is a crime that erases the evidence for its own for, for its being, for its being there, uh, and invites, therefore, the formation of very wide and complex communities of practice that call to resist it. And somehow, what is wonderful also about Hassan, and I think, and I'm looking and I'm seeing many people, or several people in this crowd that are actually part of it, is that there, isn't, there are acts of resistance here. There are people here that uh, understand the problem and have been working through initiatives, through personal relation with family members who've lost loved ones, uh, through their work as, as writers, journalists, uh, through their work as artists in, in reclaiming the space that the state has abandoned. This is what effectively we're doing here. Because the minute that uh, racism and structural racism exist. It can be structural only in as much as it involves the state, as it involves state agencies. And at the minute that happened, the answer to that is civil society, is the people actually gathering and saying, we saying no to those fines. We do not trust what the state throws at us, and we don't call for independent investigation, but rather we take over the means of production. We're saying we can produce evidence, we can produce knowledge, we can stand by the victims, by ourselves, in spite of the state and against the state, to a certain extent. For me personally, being here is also, you know, um, personally very important. Um, I have, I have an aunt here, and my aunt, Esther Friedman, uh, lives about 15 meters away from the front door of the Kunstverein. And as a, already as a student, when I was visiting her, you know, out of the window of her living room, we were seeing the Kunstverein. And somehow, as a you know, relatively provincial guy from Haifa, uh, this is where I was born, Haifa, Israel, uh, I was coming here and kind of getting my first uh, introduction into the art world through my auntie. I don't know if I don't see her here now, but uh, and through this place. Uh, so that is kind of, you know, visit my aunt and, and every time there would be another exhibition her and, and through that she kind of educated me uh, about art, etc. So this is a very um, important kind of return for me uh, personally. And, um, but forensic architecture, to introduce it to you, I think that I want to draw two, let's say, origin stories for it. Two of them are relatively known, but I'd like, I'd like to uh, make sure that we share them with you. First is that uh, for me personally, well before forensic architecture was uh, an agency, uh, I was involved in what is known as the 
human rights community in Palestine. So Palestinian-led resistance to Israeli occupation, apartheid, and other forms of settler colonial violence. I want you to understand it as another act of anti-racist violence uh, that was taking shape uh, in collaboration between Palestinian and Jewish Israelis that were refusing the government, refusing the regime into which we were brought up. And that refusal necessitated action. And that action was understanding, again, that principle that I said before. Racist violence is a violence against people and things, and it's a violence against the evidence, it's a violence against the truth, that it even occurred. Because nobody wants to be accused of racism. Nobody understands oneself as racist. And therefore, the very logic, if we accept that racism exists, we need to accept the fact that it exists in its own negation. It needs the claim need to always be articulated against a system, against a regime, against a government, that says it is not that. Racism doesn't exist. What you are experiencing, and now I'm speaking very personally to you, what we as Israelis and as Palestinians working together experienced is racism that did not acknowledge itself. We experience separate neighborhoods, we experience separations of us from our friends. We experience two sets of rules for Palestinians and Israelis, and we refused it. We didn't refuse it as Jews, particularly. We refused it because we were living there and we were seeing injustice. We refused it because it was intolerable. We refused it because it was impossible to live in that place without refusing it. It's impossible to live in a place that you one perceived as Injust as one perceived as violating human rights without finding a way, it was our lifeline uh, to oppose it. So we developed tools and techniques of doing that. And you know, as an architect, I studied architecture, I thought, okay, that's my toolbox, let's use it. And we were seeing that a lot of the violation of human rights that occurred in, uh, in Palestine was architecturally manifested. There were settlements on the hills. There were settlements that were for Jews only. They were supervising Palestinian communities in the valleys. There was the wall, there were the checkpoints. You know, the whole system seemed to kind of materialize itself, solidify into architectural matter, and therefore intensifying our look into matter and architecture allowed us to understand it differently. And we started to produce evidence. We mapped things that were unmapped because the Israeli occupation of Palestine, in fact, was negated in itself. They said, we did not occupy, we are not occupiers. We just simply live here. But that had to be mapped. And some of those techniques started to trace crimes or human rights violations that were produced on drawing boards in the way that architects were drawing lines on plans, we were seeing how an architect could sit on the drawing board and design something like a settlement in a particular way that is not to serve their community, but to generate harm to another, to create a wedge, to control, to envelope. And that started a kind of production of architectural evidence was submitted to court, etc. We were seeing there is a lot of agency in it. This is not simply something to be presented for the information of people, but that we must put that evidence at the most confrontational arenas, confrontational forums that existed, and that were the kind of the instruments of international law, international justice, uh, international criminal court in The Hague, International Court of Justice, uh, and others. Then came images. At the beginning, they dripped. In fact, in the Israel-Palestine situation, let's call it like that, in that under that regime, was the first 
that, or one of the first, where user-generated videos started to uh, be used uh, to document human rights. Palestinians started buying cameras, uploading that material, analyzing it, putting it online in archives. And as architects, we started building models and located those images in space and started interpreting them. What I want to make sure that you understand is that a lot of what you see in our work in Mexico, in Guatemala, in Colombia, in Indonesia, in Germany, in the UK, comes out of that particular, the origin of it is in that particular struggle. Now we find ourselves in Germany sometimes where our work is received, sometimes received well by people that want to see part of our work, but not another. Uh, and this is, uh, and I'm alluding to a huge kind of pressure also against our work uh, that, is, that we experience now uh, here, and we'd be happy to speak to you about it later. There is other story and there is another origin story of forensic architecture. And in particular, I want to mention it because of the theme here of three doors. And the story, which is completely unrelated to Palestine, another, a completely other starting point, is to do with a trial that I followed, again, even before I started to be um, a human rights activist, etc. In around the year 2000, I was just an architectural graduate. And there was a very strange trial that unfolded in London at the time. And it was a trial of a really heinous guy. January 2000, uh, a Holocaust denier called David Irving uh, was actually suing a publisher for calling him a Holocaust denier and forced ridiculously the publisher to prove him wrong, to prove that that thing has happened. And within that trial, and I remember being incredibly inspired and influenced and, and, and disturbed at the same time at what I was seeing, evidence, architectural evidence, started to be produced. In fact, it was the most important evidence that was produced during the Irving trial. And something struck me, one particular debate on one day during that trial, they were discussing a doorway. And that doorway was the door to a building called Crematorium 2, Crematorium 2 in Auschwitz. And they were debating the direction that the door was opening. And in fact, there were two drawings. There was one drawing that showed Crematorium 2, and this, some of you would know, is that building is the place that saw the biggest mass murder, I think, in the history of that planet. About several hundred thousand, some say 300,000 people perished within that room. And that building had a door that was drawn, you know, with an architectural notation. You know, architectural notation for a door is like a quarter circle. The door was opening inside this room, towards the inside. And then there was another plan in which everything was the same, the entire arrangement of things was the same, and the door was opening towards the outside. Just a minor shift in direction. The person that was presented this research is, was my doctor father, the person that, sorry, he was my PhD examiner rather than uh, rather than that. I know Dr. Fata is your supervisor, right? So he was my PhD examiner. And, you know, I asked him to examine my PhD after I've seen the thesis he wrote about the direction of the door. And he found, he was the first person that actually understood that the research of the Holocaust has never looked at architectural plans. People looked at testimony, people looked at documents. There was an, there was an entire planning archive, architectural archive, it was in Auschwitz, and while it was still behind the Iron Curtain in Poland, 
people ignored it. Even the greatest uh, Holocaust historian never looked at it. So he was the first one to find and to notice the direction in the change of that door. In fact, not only did it change, he found that the, the door opening inwards was actually scratched out. He didn't look also only at the drawing, he looked at the materiality of the tracing paper, transparent tracing paper that bears the mark of erasure. And we architect, when we erase ink from tracing paper, we scratch it off with a blade. So he scratched off the door that opens towards the inside. And at the same time, and we know it's at the same time, because the new line went over the scratch, and when the line go over the scratch, it doesn't, the paper doesn't hold ink in the same way. It kind of splashes a bit. And then the door is opening towards the outside. The reason that the direction of the door changed is that the building that was designed for one function, not for mass extermination, changed into um, a site of genocide. Uh, where mainly Jews were exterminated in it. And the moment of transformation was drawn onto that, within that, within that micro thing, and somehow that door, and the idea that doors could tell us a lot, stayed in my head, and kind of like a dormant thought. But it was really, you know, we were looking, and then, you know, when we started forensic architecture, we were looking at those testimonies, we were looking at the exchange, we were looking at the way the trial debated architectural evidence. And we were fascinated by this door. Changing a door changes one thing to another um, in such a meaningful way. So, three doors is not, we are not discussing here, neither the situation in Palestine. No, we discuss here the Holocaust. We're discussing principle of research and principle of resistance to um, state violence and negation. And when we started that work, we thought there's so many issues to do with the terror attack in Hanau. There's so many issues that immediately uh, occurred to us as um, kind of incomprehensible how a police force whose mandate is to protect, and if it is to protect, perhaps to protect the most threatened, the most vulnerable in society, is sometimes and somehow having a blind spot when it comes to protecting migrants or to police right-wing violence. At the same time, that very police force is so disposed to police, to know and to survey almost everything that happens within safe spaces that are frequented by migrants. This kind of duality of over-policing one community and under-protecting it, and at the same time um, developing that kind of amnesia, this kind of complete um, incompetence, error after error after error after error. What are the errors add up to? Each one could explain in itself as you know, as a, as a contingency. But you know, when all contingencies go in one way, you start asking what may lie behind them. So the idea of three doors is the idea that doors are a way to interrogate society to a certain extent. The relation between private and public is not predetermined. It is contingent always on a certain relation between privacy and publicity, between safe space and public space, between private space and a street, another kind of urban space. The three doors that we present here, the three doors that organize our thinking, are diagrams in the same way. They're diagrams because they regulate a certain relation and a certain failure of a relation between different domains of action. The questions that we are asking are you know, very wide and we cover a lot of ground. But effectively, we're asking, was that door, door number one in the exhibition, locked or unlocked? Right? And what are the consequences 
of that door, in that particular case, the Nordausgang in the arena bar, a safe space mainly for migrants, but not only. Um, was it open or closed? What does it mean if that door was locked or unlocked? The second door, the door of the perpetrator's house, again in Kesselstadt, Hanau, is another door between the street, the public domain, and the private domain. That door hasn't been opened. That door was left closed for more than four hours. Why was that door closed? What is on both sides of that door? On one side, a home, a family, family relation to a certain extent, that family cell of the perpetrator, his mother and his father, is, is also something that was incredibly interesting for us as a way of looking into and trying to understand intergenerational racism certain verticality, if you like, of continuity, uh, of racism. Whereas on the other side of the door, and you know and knew that already, there were police officers with extreme right affiliation, happy to share their affiliation amongst themselves and their belief amongst themselves. Again, people of... I, a related, if not similar, persuasion of people inside the house, outside the house. And whereas the first, the sort of the issue of intergenerational racism shows the continuity in time, outside, it shows a systematic extension in space, right? The way in which systemic racism operate within institutions. So that door between those two domains is an extremely important diagram of that relation. It doesn't only interrogate the specificity of the incident, the moments, the time, where the police was, but it's the relation between this family cell and this public space and a space occupied by state agents um, that is interrogated within that, um, the analysis uh, of this doorway. And then the third door, another door in Germany, in Dessau, behind which Ori Jallo was burned to death. And another question that is very simple. Was the door of cell five open or closed when he was torched? If it is opened, who opened it? And who stood at the open door looking into the cell as this thing is happening. So that, I want you to understand this exhibition and to return now, as my colleagues would help us now, guide us through the discussion and understanding of exactly what happened in Hanau. I want to place it for you in a context both of our work, of our beliefs, of our individual trajectories, and to understand this as those doors as political diagrams. Those doors are nothing. They're just an architectural device that regulates inside and outside in normal circumstances. When a society ceases to function, those doors become something else. And I think that with that, uh, with that bearing that in mind and having that connection, between the specificity of a case and a larger political cultural framework within it, which it is located, we need to enter uh, this exhibition. Because for us in forensics and forensic architecture, being what we call a counter forensic agency, you know, we never work with states, all our cases, and we have about 80 throughout the years, in, you know, really all over the world, those cases are um, about very, very specific incidents. We dive into the molecular scale of smoke, of, you know, computer logins, logouts, sometimes of moments, instant and split second of gunshots. These are eruptive moments 
But those eruptive moments exist within a milieu, within a certain environment, and they're connected to it. And therefore, it is only possible to undertake counter-forensic. It is only possible for civil society to gather around cases if we do this labor, this careful labor of honoring the life lost through precision, accuracy, through our emotional involvement, through um, the care within which we look at a particular case, and the labor of connecting, that connection that needs to be done, not only by us, but by all our partners uh, and colleagues that work on that. Because that work, that labor of connecting the molecular level, the split second of an incident, to the long duration of st relation within a particular state, to the long history of migration, of racism, of different histories that need to be connected to, is not easy. You don't just make from one instant to the other. You need to work that connection, that weaving, that gathering of evidence, is both technical work. As you see here, it's a static labor, meaning we're presenting it to you here to debate, for you to see, and to have to pass your own judgment on. But it's also social labor, because every case to be addressed in that way, both in the focus and in the breadth of cases, finding the long duration in a split second require building alliances, Every case is a social construction. Every case can only is as strong as the community that has produced it, as the community that uses it and mobilizes it. Here in this exhibition and in this work, we've relied upon two years of work of uh, the initiative 19 February that itself relies on the work of the relatives and parents of those lost, um, but of many experts and many other people that uh, have supported their work. And now also uh, that particular space in the city of Frankfurt that is open up not only as a kind of as an empty space for us to put on, but of thinking about how to turn the infrastructure of the art and culture into spaces of accountability, into spaces of mobilization, into acts of social construction. So I'll pass on, but I want you to bear in mind that, that, that diagram between the moment and the social construction and the kind of the, the larger implication of the events that we are uh, discussing here. Bob, on to you. Thank you. You hear me okay? Sorry? <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, yeah, thank you, Al, for a, a wonderful speech and a difficult act to follow. Certainly. Um, I want to say thank you very much, first of all, to the Kunstverein for having us, to Francisca and her whole team. Um, yes, I see you waving there. Uh, to Jutta and Anita. Uh, and to Mark and Moritz, and to Fryn and to Kevin, really the whole team. Anita. To Anita, thank you. And to Dietrich, of course. Um, I want to say thank you to our team too, to Ashkan and Julian here, um, to Emily, and uh, to all of those in Berlin and London um, for uh, producing such wonderful work together uh, in support of um, and with and on behalf of, and, and, and really um, it would have been impossible without the support and the experience and the, um, the knowledge of the, uh, the families of the victims, the survivors of the, um, the attack on the 19th of February 2020, the attack which, um, which took these nine lives. Um, I want to say thank you also to um, the um, to Mukhtar Ba and to Salio Diallo 
the uh, friend and the brother, respectively, of Uri Jalo, uh, to all their friends and supporters uh, and allies in the Initiativa, in Gedenken and Uri Jalo and beyond. Um, so I think, um, as we take you through this case and our work on it, um, we, um, we're going to pass back and forth a little bit between Dimitra and myself. Um, between us, we've uh, led the research, which has um, lasted almost a year now. Um, it was in July 2021 that we uh, received the first email uh, that would begin this, um, this collaboration. Um, and as I look at the work on the wall here, I realize that was um, just a few days, just a few weeks indeed, after the revelation that um, 13 of the uh, special forces officers who had uh, arrived on the scene that night and surrounded the house and um, waited for so long outside the door, um, the second door of our exhibition, the door that Al has already spoken so, um, so well about, um, that they had been uh, revealed, that the, the unit had been dissolved, and that through the actions of uh, the families of the victims, the survivors and their allies in the initiative 19th of February, they had, uh, it had been revealed that those 13 were on site. Now, I remember reading about this in a New York Times article, which uh, also reported that at that time, that took the number of police officers in the Hessen police force, who were either had been under investigation or were currently under investigation for connections to, or to, let's say, to connections to far-right group chats, as they are sort of shorthandedly known in, um, the, uh, in the press in this country. Um, these are group chats in which um, what is essentially Nazi memes are shared, you know, right -wing, extreme right-wing content is shared. Um, 100 Hessen officers have been under investigation or are currently under investigation for these sympathies and these connections. And it was into that space that, that we moved with this collaboration. So I want to tell you, we want to tell you about two uh, aspects of our work reflected in two films that you'll see in the room across the hall. Um, we're not going to take you step by step through each investigation. One, indeed, was presented um, by one of the survivors, Saeed Etris Hashemi, who was uh, in the arena bar um, on the night of the attack with his brother, Saeed Nessa, with Hamza Kurtovic, uh, and with two other friends. Uh, and that work related to the locked emergency exit, the Notausgang, um, about which uh, many of you are, um, uh, I'm sure, familiar with the story of the work that we've done there. Um, and and uh, Dimitra will shortly take you through um, some reflections on that case um, and some new, um, some new parts of the story, a new chapter which we think is just beginning, uh, due in no small part to the work of uh, Armin and Diana Kurtovic. Um, thereafter, I'd like to talk to you um, about a little part of the, um, the second film related to the perpetrator's house. Uh, and we'll, we'll speak and, and, and perhaps afterwards think together about how, the, uh, how, this, this, how to, to take this knowledge that 100 officers serving in the Hessen police uh, have, have been investigated for this connection. How we are to take that knowledge um, and, and, and through it, see the, the, the complete failure of the police operation to pursue and apprehend a uh, violent, a racist, extremist murderer, um, an operation which was demonstrably dysfunctional um, and which, as Al has alluded to, justifies itself uh, after the fact uh, it tries to explain now its own failings away, failing after failing after failing, each of which perhaps can be uh, made into some conditional, explained, given some kind of excuse, but when we see every one of these failures stacked on top, on top, on top, 
I think we have to think together about what it means, and it's, it's a, a privilege to have this opportunity and this space to do that. Um, so I believe, at this point, I'm going to pass over to Dimi to talk about the emergency exit. Thank you. Um, thanks, Bob, and I would uh, and thanks, Ayal. And I would also like to thank um, everyone at the Kunstverein for this intense months of work and um, our team for this intense mo months of work. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's your earring. Oh. Okay, I'll try not to move. Um, and um, obviously the victims' families and their allies who have trusted, who have been uh, deposited their trust in us in doing this together and doing this collectively. And yesterday was such an incredible experience for everyone involved and I think that will resonate a lot and we hope that it will um, instigate more change in a to a certain extent. Um, as Bob explained, we will not guide you through every step of our work in relation to HANA, but we want to discuss um, to give you an idea of how we have conducted this work as well as contextualize it within this question. So um, the arena bar and the kiosk was the second attack site of the perpetrator. The attack itself took place within six minutes from the first attack site in the center of HANA to the second attack site in Kesselstad lasted six minutes. The second attack site that we see here in the plan um, was the arena bar um, and the a, a kiosk next door. And in the back behind the camera number six that you see is actually the emergency exit of the bar. The bar was... Uh, covered with CCTV cameras, which uh, documented or captured almost all the areas of the bar apart from the emergency exit. So you, see, you can see the emergency exit is actually an area that we cannot, um, is, is not documented. The question that we were tasked with exploring was not, was the emergency exit locked? The question that we were tasked to explore was, did the people who were in the bar when the perpetrator entered the lobby have enough time to escape through the, the emergency exit if it had been open? Because that was also one of the arguments by the prosecutor when closing the case that it cannot be assumed with, with sufficient certainty that these individuals had enough time to escape through an unlocked emergency exit. So what we did was that we closely examined this CCTV footage uh, from all six cameras. We synchronized them, we corrected the timestamp of the CCTV cameras, and we tracked everyone's movements inside the bar. Um, then we mirrored, we will, I will not go through all the methodology, but essentially we um, analyzed their paths and then mirrored their paths to establish how long would it have taken them to reach the emergency exit and exit, escape the bar. And we reached this conclusion. This is the final still of the final positions when the perpetrator would enter. So from the time that Etris, one of the survivors and brothers of Said Nessar, sees the perpetrator with a, hand, with a gun in his hand entering the lobby until the time the perpetrator actually enters the arena bar because the perpetrator first goes to the kiosk and kills Ferhatun Var, Mercedes Kirpaj, and uh, Gökhan Gültekin. So there were nine seconds. Nine seconds is a long time when you're fleeing for your life. And Armin, who is here, I don't know if he's here right now, I don't see him, 
but uh, Armin Kurtovich, the father of Hamza Kurtovich, who was killed in the bar when he was presenting, talking about uh, the Notausgang in the Untersuchungsausschuss at Skardli, Wiesbaden, he gave nine seconds of silence so that everyone can feel how, how much time this is. So essentially, our, our conclusion of, the, of that analysis is that indeed, all four people would have been completely out of sight of the perpetrator by the time he arrived. The fifth people that we see here would have been within his line of sight only for a fraction of a second and in the long distance before moving out of view as well. Essentially, showing that indeed all five, all of the five individuals who were sat in the front of the bar during the time of the attack could have survived the attack if the emergency exit was open and they had known that. Now, there are a lot of indications about why the people there would expect the emergency exit to be locked. Um, and that was because it was indeed found to be locked in the past, in several occasions, by official authorities, as well as, and there are reports that the, f the history of the bar, the, the troubling history and relationship of the bar with the police was a contributing factor to that door being locked. Now, this is what we see here, is the sketch done by one of the police officers that after the attack that actually mark, mark, who actually marked the, these two doors, one the Notausgang on the top and the left is one door leading to a small cabinet. The, he marked them as being locked. The other police officer who was with him, when he was asked about whether the Notausgang was open during the securing of the crime scene, he said no. But then he qualified his answer and, he, and said, as far as I know. So you can see the no is written on the typewriter, the as far as I know is added by a pen. Um, both police officers qualified their answers later um, by saying that it may have not been locked, it may have just been jammed, and also excusing the fact that they are not 100% sure by saying that the, the same police officer who qualified their answer in the same statement had written that the crime scene was not secured and examined in, the, in, its, in, in detail because the perpetrator is obviously dead. So that tells us quite a lot about what the police is investigating us and how. The first of those documents, sorry, is, uh, is, uh, um, is a record of the, tw of the twice uh, previously that the Hanau public prosecutor is aware of that the uh, Nordas gang was, was locked, 2013, 2017. And below is, sorry, is the quote that you were discussing, excuse me. Um, and the survivors, as you see here in the left sketches, actually, these are made by Etris and Peter. And Peter, this, the day, the morning after the attack, said that the emergency exit was locked. It was not something that came after months. It was immediately stated by him to the police in his statement. And you see here a, a sketch on the bottom of Etris who, that shows what route they would have taken had they known that the emergency exit was open instead. Now, our investigation again was based on these multiple reports that, and testimonies of survivors that they knew the door to be routinely locked. Yesterday, in the press conference um, that we had in the morning, Armin Kurtovich, that we see here, presented additional evidence 
that actually suggests that it was not only an expectation created by previous times that they had tried to go through that emergency exit and they had found it locked. It, it was actually an expectation that was created from that same night, a few hours after the attack, because they tried to go through the emergency exit and it was locked. You might not be able to see the time code here, but the time code on uh, this image says 21.22. Now, even if we account for the seven minutes uh, and one second that the CCTV was out of sync with real time, this means we are less than an hour before the perpetrator enters the bar. So this, what, what Armin has presented yesterday is these screenshots where you see someone going towards the back, the area that is blind to the camera, which is the area of the emergency exit, and coming back after a few seconds. And he's presenting that together with uh, official signs, statements by the people, survivors of the bar, as well as the people that were there before the attack who are attempting to go through the emergency exit and they find it locked. Um, and one of those people who is looking at others trying to go to the emergency exit and then coming back was Hamza himself. So that is why Armin himself is always saying that Hamza knew. It was not only he was expecting it, he knew it was locked at night. Um, something of a quick transition from uh, one door to the next. Um, yeah, the photo that we just showed you of Amin, um, if, I, if I may just add a couple of my own thoughts, because this was, um, as Dimitra has alluded to, this was one of the most uh, powerful professional experiences, I think, uh, that we as a team have, have felt. To, to stand alongside Armin and Niku and Chetin and Yulia and so many other of the um, families of the victims and the survivors. Um, and also indeed Mukhtar and uh, Saliu. Um, to stand beside them and, and, and to, uh, uh, to see our work and our research integrated with their own um, strengthening one another was, was, was a remarkable experience. You know, the work that we presented initially on the Nordhaus gang, which was, um, you know, very, it, was, it, it, was, it was well received by, the, by, by, by Armin and by others. He was very happy, he was grateful that we'd done that work. And then it was, it was Armin himself who took that work one step further. Um, and this sentiment that we um, had understood as underpinning the importance of the, uh, the nine seconds research that we did, the, the, the research into nine seconds that we did. It took much longer than nine seconds. Um, it was predicated on this idea that um, those young men had experienced over-policing the CCTV cameras in that bar. Uh, that's far more CCTV cameras than you would expect to see in such a small bar. Why is that? was predicated on this feeling that that bar and the people in it had been over-policed, that they expected that door to be locked, but it wasn't that they expected that door, that door to be locked because of something they'd felt for years. They'd watched four people try and get out of that door an hour earlier. And so those nine seconds, those nine seconds they realized, they knew that door was locked already and they were looking for other options. And we'll come back to what the prosecutor had to say about that a little bit later on because Right now, I want to take you to uh, the police operation. Um, I'm going to sort of throw us in halfway through here. Um, so the police operation really began in the minutes after 10 o'clock on the 19th of February. We know that sometime between 5 past 10 and 10 past 10, uh, the police in Heston were aware of the license plate of the perpetrator's car and therefore the home address of the perpetrator. Um, and the first units were scrambled to, uh, to move towards that address. There were three units uh, that were first to, to be sent there. Um, 
they were um, politician in civil, I suppose you would say. Uh, they were plain clothes surveillance police um, from a, a, a division of the Hessen police, with the Operativa Einheit. There were uh, six officers in three cars, two officers in each car, and here you see the three locations to which they were sent. Um, on top of uh, our model of the area around the perpetrator's house, which is highlighted here, um, the perpetrator's house and the perpetrator's car, um, three units were sent. Uh, the first arrived here, on the corner of Kantstrasse and Kirchhoffstrasse. Um, the second here on Humboldtweg. The first was, uh, uh, their mission was to observe the car, to make sure that the car didn't go anywhere uh, with the perpetrator in it. The second unit was to observe the front door of the house, to make sure that nobody went in or out. And the third unit over here uh, was waiting in case the car, uh, in case the perpetrator returned to his car, this unit would be ready to block this escape route here, this secondary escape route. This was the plan. When you put it on a map like this, I think you can see that it's an incomplete plan. And when you read, I don't mean that to sound funny, excuse me, but it's in the delivery, I suppose. And when you read the statements of the SAK officers, the, the, the special forces, the Einsatzkommandos who came afterward, uh, whose mission it would be to enter this house, and who, uh, in support of whom these surveillance officers would ensure that nobody went in or out of this house, uh, that this house remained a steady state until the heavily armed, heavily protected officers arrived to apprehend uh, the perpetrator, um, even they saw, as soon as they arrived, that this wasn't a good plan. And they wrote that in their statements. And not least, because nobody's watching the back garden. We're not here to talk about police strategy, but nobody's watching one of the doors of the house. With regard to the second officer, the second car, They said that they arrived at 10, uh, 10 .30, between 10.30 and 10.45. This is what they said afterwards as, as, as the investigators were picking through this operation. Um, it's not the clip I want to show yet, in fact. Um, as the helicopter, which is flying around over, the, um, over, the, over the, the town that night, as it at one point passes the, uh, the area above the perpetrator's house, at about 11.03, we see that that car is not yet in position. We know that because we see it a few minutes later in position. I want to show you that later clip. Uh, to get to the conclusion first, uh, that car is in position for a maximum of 18 minutes. We don't see it at 11.03. We do see it at 11.21. 11.21, it's leaving its position. Here I want to show you a short clip um, from our investigation. Here you see us uh, photo matching um, helicopter footage drawn from the Attorney General's investigation. Um, now what you see here is two of the three cars. Now one is out of position and moving. Police, number, police car number one um, has gotten into an exchange, has been interrupted in its surveillance, um, has uh, essentially been run off the corner and chased into a cul-de-sac. Here we see them just leaving that uh, cul-de-sac. They put out an all-points notice. They say, we're in trouble. Someone, someone's making life difficult for us. They said that later that these guys were connected to the Hells Angels. Uh, and Police 2 leaves its position in support. At this point, you're seeing police car number two crossing right past the perpetrator's house. This row here, the perpetrator's house, no longer is the front door in, in, in view. Right now, uh, we are at um, 21 minutes past 11. Oh dear, sorry. And what you see um, is that uh, the, the front door is no longer under surveillance. It will not be under surveillance again until 
half past midnight if we take the essay car at their word. Certainly at 25 past midnight, the last time we see the front door, there's no, no clear evidence that that door is under surveillance. This officer leaves their post and they write in their statement that they know that from that point onward, the door is not under surveillance. What do we have here? It's the same clip. Good. Don't tell me it's the same clip again. I mentioned the, the, the helicopter. The helicopter is uh, a, a, a fascinating um, case in point about the uh, total dysfunction uh, that, 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 that ran through this operation. I don't know how many of you have seen any of the reporting that came out in the last 24 hours following the press conference that we held uh, with, uh, together with the families of the victims. But to put, no, no, to put a fine point on it, to, to, to beat around, around the bush, not at all, the, the police helicopter never knew where it was supposed to be. It flew for two hours over the city of Hanau, town of Hanau, and it never knew what it was supposed to be doing. And we, how do we know this? Because the two pilots, they speak to each other, and we have that recording, and we share some of that recording with you in our film. And they say, why is no one speaking to us? Did we ever get the address? They say the radio is not working. They need to sort this radio out. They say the radio never works, which is not reassuring. Not reassuring. But it's using this material that our investigation uh, into the police conduct really began. Here is the helicopter without knowing, catching the first evidence that the, he that the perpetrator uh, is, uh, has arrived back at their house. Here is their car and here their house. But the helicopter has no idea what it's caught. And I show you the clips in this order. I, show you, I talk about the, the, uh, the surveillance officers first, uh, before we talk about the helicopter, because the, 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 the catastrophic failures uh, of, of, of the operation that the surveillance teams on the ground uh, are responsible for would really have mattered a lot less if someone had told the helicopter where they were supposed to be looking. I mean, let's talk about why this, the absurdity is almost funny. There's a surreality to what's going on here. But of course, it's not, it's not that. Um, I might be at the end of what I want to say about the police for now. Um, thereafter come the SA car. When the SA car arrive, they say, well, the one of the first things they recognize is that this operation was a failure. But they say, they weren't too concerned about that because, and this is in the written statements of the SA car, they say they're not too concerned about that because the perpetrator doesn't seem like the kind of guy to leave his house again. Now, when we read that for the first time, in my mind, that sits alongside what the prosecutor said about the five young men who didn't try to escape from the emergency exit, two of whom paid for their lives paid with their lives. Because, and it speaks to what Hayal means, all of these decisions are always just, they always just break the right way. They always just break for the state. What do you mean you weren't surveilling the house of, of a man who has very recently demonstrated his murderous intent, and, and demonstrated his murderous intent to the people who live all around him here? He chose the arena bar for a reason, because of the people who lived around him. They were his target. And the fact that he didn't go on and continue uh, what he began is no thanks at all to the police. That's pure fortune. And the SA car arrive and they say, ah, oh, well, he probably wasn't going to do that anyway. And the prosecutor, what does the prosecutor say? It, it doesn't really matter if, we, if, if the emergency exit was locked or not because it, they, they wouldn't have run. They wouldn't have run that way because they had to run slightly toward the, the perpetrator before they ran away again. And in any case, it's really difficult to know whether they would have made it there. It's not difficult to know. We showed that they would have made it there. But every time these decisions break, it turns out everybody is a psychologist and everybody determines that uh, what would have happened, what, what, what conduct we could have expected, always gets the state off the hook. Um, I think you're going to talk about our timeline now, huh? I think it's a, we have it a gone a bit to stop? long, we but sure I just have. want to say. Oh gosh, I no, even talked about the experiment. I just want to say <laughs> that uh, just follow up on on what you said 
last and because obviously like the it needs to be made clear that the police of failure to secure the perpetrator's house is not seen alone it needs to be viewed across uh, alongside all the other failures and that is what we highlight here in uh, in in the exhibition it's not the fact alone that the police did not work the way they should have right it is when you see it in relation to the over police and under protection when you see when you start thinking about what they would have done differently if the perpetrator was another person right so when you think about this this relations is when the, the political urgency of, of what this means becomes evident. So, and I, so it, these failures are not just the, the only failures of the night. They are alongside the locked emergency exit. They are alongside the unanswered emergency calls. And here we have three films that we invite you to watch that were done by members of the initiative on the matter of the unanswered emergency calls who cost Vili Viral Pound his life. Um, and again, there the prosecutor states that similar to the arena bar and the perpetrator, that actually we don't know if really would have obeyed the advice of the police and stop when they told him to stop following the perpetrator. This is the, this is the response they give about the causality between the unanswered emergency calls and Bailey's life. This is not even just rude, it's like they blame Billy for being killed. So, um, just to finish there, there is obviously a lot of other issues like police not attending to victims in a in a timely manner, and everything, all of this, we have them documented in our timeline, and we do, we do invite you to take a close look at it. Um, it's not documenting just the night, it's documenting the investigation of the night as well. So we have corrected almost all the police timings, and that applies both to the timings that are we have um, access to through the CCTV footage of the different bars, but also the same timings about the emergency calls. Even those are not what the police and the prosecutor say. Which actually means that then we go back that there is, and the victims' families have been saying that. It's not as just the attack. There has been a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth attack on them. And when they are not heard, they need to scream and intervene, and this is why we all do this together with them. It's, I think it's That's a good spot to finish. Thank you. I guess uh, we'll take questions, uh, Francisca. Is there still time? Or one or two? Leave it at that. I think, what do you think? I reckon that everyone's uh, quite taken by what we all just heard. So maybe you want to take some seconds and eventually take your time to answer, to make some questions which, uh, which you could take for the next 20 minutes if you wish. Okay, that's good to us. great. If you feel like um, that was exhausted enough, yeah. that's great. Then, of course, we're happy also with that. No, we'd really like to hear your questions, please. I, uh, maybe, maybe we need to wait for the mic, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, while, while the others just try to 
um, think about what you've just said, right? Um, just one hour ago, I was over there and um, so also had a look at the sound simulation you've done, right, at this gunshot. And uh, you've kind of missed it here. <laughs> and um, but for me, it was very interesting to, to hear the, or read these statements of the father saying, I haven't heard it. And also police officers around or, or the, the one and two and three cars saying they haven't heard it as well, right? So I, I believe maybe for the audience as well, for people maybe haven't seen it yet, it would be interesting to hear um, your comments on that. Do you want to take it, TV, or should I? Sure, I mean, we actually didn't speak about it because we were running over time. <laughs> <laughs> We have the but slides here. here. <laughs> um, but to, to take it back to where Bob had left it in relation to the helicopter, the helicopter um, is looking at the perpetrator's house for around 14 minutes and by accident. While it's flying over two hours, two hours and ten minutes, it's just looking at the perpetrator's house for around 14 minutes, which means that these 14 minutes are, are our only visual source of information about that night. Keep your heads down. Yes. Um, for that reason, and because uh, alongside the question, how did the police operation unfold, was the question exactly how could the police have failed to hear the shots? And is the father's testimony truthful that he just heard shots is coming outside the house? So what we did was that we, we created a, a detailed model of the perpetrator's house that we can, you can see in more detail in our, in our film. We abstracted it into an acoustic model and we recreated one to one in a, as a physical installation in a house identical to the perpetrator's house. Sorry, I'm just trying to... Of course. And this is that scene inside the recreated acoustic model. And there we... <coughs> Sorry, continue. Okay. Um, you got it? Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, and there we recreated the acoustic properties of the gunshot. We didn't play the actual gunshot sound um, because for several reasons, the main being uh, to avoid re-traumatizing the neighbors who were living there. Um, this was in the same residential estate um, and obviously the residents had gone through a tremendous experience. And so we we are acoustic experts. Yes, our acoustic experts created different variations of the of the gunshot sound, which is what we played, which uh, kept all the acoustic qualities of the gunshot, but were not perceived as as as, as one. For example, the gunshot in reverse, um, and we did several. Um, we played the sound several times. The sounds several times with different variables, and essentially we were able to then transpose these results into our digital model of the neighborhood, which you can see here, in order to start understanding how loud this, the gunshot sound would have been in the, in the area around the house. Um, and this is a sound propagation map that roughly tells you, it's indicative obviously, not, not rough lines, um, but roughly tells you how loud it would have been in the back of the house, in the immediate surroundings, and you can see that it is actually quite loud. The gunshot sound is one of the loudest sounds that one can tolerate, and it's also harmful if you're close to it. So you can see that in the area behind the house, it would be as, as loud as a... Um, as a chainsaw. Chainsaw, yes. as a jackhammer in the, uh, in, inside the house, and, but as we were actually looking for several <laughs> references for that, and everyone has a different understanding of what is the loudest sound they can have. So, um, 
But even in the area, in the third grade here that you can see, it would be as loud as, as a passing car, standing next to a passing car. But generally we had to obviously translate sound pressure, so the levels of, of, of uh, the sound, to audibility, which is a much more complex um, thing to assess. Um, and audibility depends on several things. One of them is obviously what is the background noise, not the source noise that you are trying to measure, whether it is audible, but what is the background noise. And this is what we, we did measure. We measured background noise at a similar night as the, the night of the attack, similar weather conditions, and we measured the background noise at around 25 dB, which is very, very quiet. Um, however, as we mentioned before, the helicopter who was in the area, and, but they didn't know what to do, they were producing noise. So it was a, a main source of, of additional noise that would impact when coming closer than 600 meters to the house, it would potentially impact the audibility of the gunshots around. Um, and here we see here we see the audibility field with taking into consideration. So, in, obviously, audibility also is, is based on subjective factors uh, and perception. We have no way to access the perception of the police officers, so we use the a conservative um, standard for audibility, which is that something is clearly audible when it is 10 dB above the background noise. Um, and we created these maps with, uh, I know, I know it's not there, but I don't know, it's uh, maybe, ah, okay. We created these audibility maps with different distances of the helicopter from the house, in order, and we then started to see that even though the helicopter may have impacted the audibility around the house, there are areas very close on the back, for example, where the shots would have been clearly audible even with a helicopter at close range, at the closest distance that ever came, which was 400 meters. Which essentially what, tells us, what this tells us is that as the, as the police say they didn't hear any gunshots, and if we are to take this claim as a truthful claim, it means that they did not hear them because they were not in the right position to secure the house, which is something that essentially supports our visual investigation. Um, it's okay. Um, and in there, additionally, in relation to the father's st statements, um, the father claimed to have been uh, fall to have gone to sleep at around 8 p.m. in the night. Um, and to have woken up at around midnight by police activity in one statement, uh, drone, in the another statement, blue lights, etc. And then at some point to have heard two shots, two or three shots, as but he insisted in all his statements that these did not came, come from the inside of the property, that they came from outside the house. Um, essentially, together with our acoustic experts, we examined this claim uh, and we, we established that it is much more likely, since the, the, the father's, perpetrator's father's bedroom was directly above the living room where the two shots were fired, it would have been much more likely for someone to, under, to perceive the shots as coming from inside the property rather than from outside. And this, again, was in, uh, this was not the only contra contradiction that was examined. There are other contradictions that exist within the same case files that the prosecutor has um, that relate to internet activity, for example, at the time that the SA cars are gathering in the corner. Um, at that specific time, there is seven minutes of internet activity in one of the computers, 12 minutes, I'm sorry, of internet activity in one of the computers next to the father's bedroom in one of the father's computers, essentially. Um, and that internet activity consisted of, amongst other things, 
repeatedly searching for the perpetrator's website. More than 50 searches to the perpetrator's website. The perpetrator's website was a website where he hosted his extreme far-right racist content. So videos, but also statements um, and other things. Um, so at, there is no material evidence that connects the perpetrator to that use of the computer that night. He himself had several computers in his room in the basement. Um, and th but there is, on the contrary, s some evidence that may suggest that it's probably the father that used the computer that night, which again contradicts his statements that he was asleep and that he did not witness anything happening inside the house. Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry we lost the, the visual aid halfway through, but um, it's all in the film, of course. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, work. It's, uh, it's so important from the first thing that you told, the uh, mapping which you did for the occupation in Palestine, or now the, the way uh, to the Notausgang, it's uh, these uh, visualizations that are so uh, important uh, and impressive to understand, to see what is happening. This, these are the things that are not told in uh, television or newspapers like this, but these are the, after the investigative thinking you do, um, and, uh, and with these uh, visualizations for everybody to understand, ah, this is, um, this is happening. It, uh, it's very clear to everybody, uh, for everybody to understand. And uh, my question is, how do you get these informations, like the, the recording of the pilots, uh, of the police pilots uh, speaking? Uh, how did you, did you get this uh, you recording? You put us in trouble, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I think no, that no, we no, could no. say that we have received this information in a legal way. A legal way? You said a legal way. Okay, because I was Illegal thinking the police way. would, uh, yeah, they would not uh, give it to you and... Uh, it's yeah. been obtained legally. It's been obtained legally and publication of uh, material from a case file which has been concluded is entirely in line with, uh, with the law. Oh. But this investigation for the state, this investigation is over. They found out everything they need. Uh, yeah, I have a question just adding to what you just said. So Great. the investigation is concluded, but in the moment when you have a new evidence that questions this, it cannot be reopened? Thank you, that's a wonderful question. I think that gives us a lot to talk about. No, no I mean it. Um, because... Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's no, easy, no easy thing, one would imagine, to force the reopening of, a, um, of an investigation um, or even the consideration of an investigation by the Attorney General, by the Federal Attorney General. Um, and... Indeed, what we see uh, on this timeline to, to your left um, is precisely an examination of um, the exploration of options by a movement, by a civil society uh, collaborative network, when, uh, as we see this cascade of black marks at the top right of the image, um, when legal avenues are closed off to... Um, to, to that movement, to the, uh, the, the, the survivors, to the bereaved families, to those who, are, who, who pursue and deserve accountability. Um, some of you might recognize this format of mural from the last time that we came to Hessen. 
We devised a mural like this to tell the story of the, the, the initiatives that had come together to uh, try to pursue accountability for the NSU murders uh, in, a, in a context which is not entirely dissimilar, where the state simply does not want to hear uh, the, 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 the clear situated knowledge, the experience of the victims of the violence that's been perpetrated and the violence that's been ignored and minimized and explained away by uh, all parts of the state. And so whether we are pushing to reopen the Federal Attorney General's investigation or finding other ways to, uh, as AL said, to take the means of evidence production and investigation into our own hands and indeed into our own hands, along with the, the survivors, along with the family members of the, of the victims, along with all their supporters in the initiative 19th in February and, and more widely, um, you know, that's, that's, that's the question, and that's, that's, that's really the proposition, I suppose, that um, when uh, the forensic process, when the state's forensic process, when the, when the, the procession from crime scene to, uh, to analysis to courtroom to sentence is disrupted by the entanglement of, of, of the state, whether that's the direct entanglement of state agents or the mishandling, the failure, um, the, the widespread far-right sympathies, um, then other approaches need to be tried and other, investiga other investigative means need to be worked out and other forums uh, need to be found for those, the products of those investigations to be spoken in. Yes, I would just like to add to this that, um, for example, the, also the case of Uri, we see how 17 years now, they tried to open the case. It's not that you abandon that mm -hmm. avenue, mm -hmm. You try and then you, you get um, obstacles and then you get to try again and then, but you try every way you can. So in every other avenue that is not closed. Um, so that is because obviously the Hanau attack is more recent and the, case, the closing of the case is more recent, but it will go in a similar way. So there will be appeals that then they would be uh, submitted and then um, denied and then submitted again. But at the same time, the struggle operates in all these different forums that you can see also in the timeline. And that is very prominent also for Uri's case. And we saw it, how they spoke about it yesterday, um, both his brother and his friend, Mukhtar and Salur. not going to be able to have a cake course be opened. Um, this is not going to get lost like it would be when you wouldn't have done what you do. So I think it is very great what you're doing, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, imagine you'd be the Staatsanwalt for a couple of weeks or something. So you're in Hessen, you, are, you have the power. What would be the worst, no, the best case scenario? What would you imagine they would do? We would like the uh, investigation of the father uh, for complicity in the crime to be open. We'd like the father to be uh, prosecuted. Um, and through the father, uh, understand the context um, through the father and the father's relation to the son and the father's relation to the wider network, travel outwards and kind of start understanding the branches of that story. That's one. Two, we would like uh, to see a civil suit of the, uh, on behalf of the family of the families for their abandonment. We would like to see them compensated to the degree that, uh, you know, uh, to some extent it's extremely hard to put a, a price on a life. 
but the state must really um, effectively pay the price, uh, pay for, uh, for that loss. Uh, and we would like the process of, that is within the Auschwitz, Untersuchung Auschwitz, to have much more teeth in it. Uh, we, would like, we would like the people that are responsible removed from the job. We would like to see that different processes are put in place. And we would like to see that a kind of a different policing is possible. You know that there's been a huge debate in the US, abol police abolition, right? I mean, is the police the right social institution to protect society? The police in the U.S. has, you know, incredibly and, you know, in a different way, contaminated by, you know, kind of almost irreparable uh, structural racism. And there are calls, and the calls for abolition is not to say, oh, we live without protection. They're saying we need other institutions to keep us safe. Some of the things that the police does need to be, you know, delegated to other institutions. I, you know, I have not seen a case in Europe that so much calls for police abolition as this case. I think, you know, I think Hessen police has crossed the threshold of being an, a, an institution that could be, you know, kind of like repaired, uh, reformed by those kind of parliamentary processes with, you know, inter-party veto on, on what is the decision-making that to be done. I think that civil society need to ask here on a, on a much more general level for a different way from the state to guarantee our protection here so that we can live here, so that people could, could actually feel safe and live in this state. I'd also like to thank you for your precious work um, and all of this information and for making it visible. Um, for me, I wondered, like, how is your work backed up? Like, it needs a lot of resources. One of them is financial, like, financially. Like, how is it financially aided, um, all this kind of work? Because it's a lot of work. Um, and because it is so complex and it's uh, against um, the state, um, how do you...? Particularly two, two sources for this case, very clearly. One is this institution uh, has picked up much of the costs. And this is another thing to say for, um, you know, using art and cultural institutions or reclaiming them as sites of political accountability. Uh, it couldn't have happened without the funding that we've received from, uh, from the Frankfurt Kunstverein. And the second, and even larger source of income, is individual donations, small individual donations to the initiative 19 February uh, that have been designated and uh, particularly for this work. So, yeah, go on the website. Allow me to add on this last uh, comment of yours, Eyal, that it's uh, also part of a coalition that we raised as Frankfurter Kunstverein when it, responding to your, request, to, to your question about the funding. It's not that we have the funding ourselves to be able to fund such an exhibition. We do a lot of uh, work in trying to raise this and uh, applying in public and private institutions and foundations that believe in the work that is, yeah, the work that we present or we wanted to present in, as a project, as a future project. And therefore we have three public entities and a private entity that supports that this sort of investigation is being produced and delivered and presented in a cultural institution. I think this is also something that is meaningful to be addressed because it's part of an equation that un otherwise we are not able to consider and to debate as well. And in this case, it's always mentioned wherever we do communication, it's the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung, especially for the more discursive parts, 
and for the 10 videos here where um, the witnesses of the, of the, and the families are being shown, it's the Ministry of Wissenschaft und Kunst, of Arts and Science, and uh, it's also the Kultur von Frankfurt Rhein-Main. Thank you for having me add this as well to <laughs> your public awareness. <laughs> okay. Enjoy the exhibition. <laughs>